What's going on? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And today we are discussing the hero's journey, also known as the monomyth. In particular, we're going to answer a question from one of my subscribers about how to use archetypes when there are less characters in a story. And before we get into that, I just want to say, look, I just woke up, and even though I just took a shower, I still feel a little ratchet. I may even look a little ratchet, so if that's the case, just bear with me. The other thing is they're doing some sort of construction over on this side of the apartment, so if you hear crazy noises, I apologize. With that being said, now let's get to the question. The question comes from my subscriber whose code name is X Y <laughs> his uh, I guess his, his real name is Brian and he's writing a script and he's got some good ideas for a script from what I see here he's got some uh, some subtle symbology going on with some of the characters that he's planning but the meat and potatoes of his question can be boiled down to this right here he says Josh how do I use the hero's journey in a story with less characters? Pretty cut and dry. Pretty good question if you ask me. It's something that I may have brushed over in other videos, but I've never really done a video that addresses this in from this angle. So I think it's a, a pretty good question. And first thing I'm going to do is just give you guys the bottom line. The bottom line is you absolutely can use the hero's journey for stories that have less characters and the the main thing is some archetypes may not even show up and also some characters may take on various roles now if you recall from my earlier video on archetypes and if you haven't seen it go ahead and check it out later I basically say that there are two kinds of archetypes when people are talking about story and things like that the first kind is the persona archetype and that archetype is very character dependent is very unique to that character that is not what we're talking about today and um, again, you can you can watch the other videos, but uh, Victoria Lynn Schmidt, she wrote this book, 45 Master Characters. She also wrote this other book that I have here, Characters, uh, Writer's Guide to Characterization. She's, she's written other books too, but I believe that they're two of the greatest books on persona archetypes that are out there. That is not what we're talking about today, but I want to be very clear that that is not what we're talking about because sometimes people hear archetype and if you haven't seen my other videos or, or you haven't done a lot of study into this you might get confused okay those archetypes are more persona based and it's very rare that that a character will take on more than one main archetype there or change their archetype however there's another set of archetypes called that I consider the role archetype. This is the role that the character uh, uses in the story. And that is the the role archetype is the archetype that is most associated with the the monomyth and the hero's journey. And the reason for that is because many of these archetypes were I don't want to say discovered because they've been around a long time before then, but were kind of defined through psychoanalytics, which is what Freud is best known for. But it was his disciple and his protege, Carl Jung, who really went in depth about archetypes. And when Joseph Campbell wrote his book, about the monomyth, he, he tied closely with psychoanalytics because what he was trying to do at the time was prove academically that all of these mythological stories 
have a deep psychological meaning to us. So, not to go into this, I mean, you again, watch my other video on archetypes, but the key here is that there, there are a handful of archetypes that are known for in the hero's journey. There are also a couple more outside of that that are in psychology that I would say probably can be squeezed into the hero's journey as well. It's just they're not, the thing that, again, Joseph Campbell pointed out the things that all of the mythologies had in common. Whereas Carl Jung pointed out these are all the archetypes that we in our deep conscience recognize with. So with all that being said, how do you how do you take a, a story that has less characters and fit all those archetypes in? Well, the first thing is I don't think you have to fit all of the archetypes in. And it really depends on you. This is where it's writer dependent, how you want to use it. And and it's also a gut feeling. It's it's does it seem right when you write it, when you when you start to plot it out, when you start to structure, when you start to put the lines on the paper, does it sound right? Does it strike you as genuine and real? Because if it doesn't, then that probably means you're forcing it. Or if you're getting writer's block on a particular character or space because you're trying to make that archetype fit in, maybe it doesn't belong there. Maybe it doesn't belong at all, right? The, the thing with archetypes, though, role archetypes, is that they're like masks, meaning that they can be taken off and then someone else can put them on. Or you can take one off, a character, a character can take one off and wear another one and then bounce between different masks. And what I've seen, not always, but generally speaking, the you, you'll see shorter stories either eliminate archetypes completely or have, char have certain characters take on multiple roles and one of the best examples that I can think of that everybody will know from a movie that we've all seen a story we, we all know is the character Gollum from Lord of the Rings in Lord of the Rings Gollum is the shadow to Frodo Gollum is he acts as a guide and a mentor to Frodo he also acts as a shapeshifter because at one point they see him as one thing, basically a bad guy. And then at another point, they see him as a good guy. And then at another point, he's a bad guy again. He is also the trickster because he has, he has in some ways deceived the, the fellowship by making them think that he's he's a good guy and really the whole multiple personalities was a great depiction by J.R.R. Tolkien to make it seem very real that this character would be so conflicted and so so different but it, it also shows that like there's a light side and a dark side a good side and a bad side to every character even if they are ultimately what we would consider a villain so there, just in, just in that one character, you see about four archetypes being displayed throughout the course of a story. And what I've also known, I, it's been a long time since I've seen Castaway, but from what I remember from Castaway, Castaway is another good one where once Tom Hanks is left on the island. He's deserted on the island and he's all on his own for a while. There's no other characters but him and Wilson the ball. So what ends up happening is he ends up taking on some of those archetypes himself in the sense of, excuse me, in the sense of, in a way he almost has multiple personalities. Even Wilson, because Wilson's not a real person but he believes that Wilson is so Wilson takes on the sidekick role sometimes a mentor role it's really strange but the point is I think the point there is not only can 
one character take on multiple roles and that character can be your hero as well but also inanimate objects can too you could have for example i think in that same in the in that same story you have his his wife or his his fiance from from before the crash he had like a picture of her and he would always look at that picture that to me that's the goddess right she represents the goddess she represents this fulfillment this in his mind of wholeness of 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 being a whole person again and that's why what he's trying to aim to get back to so the the point here that i'm trying to make is don't trick yourself into thinking that the hero can't have multiple roles sometimes the hero can become his own mentor and actually one of the things that chris vogler mentions in his book the writer's journey i don't i'm not on it right now but basically let me see if i can find the page real quick he he talks about uh, it it'd be too hard to find while doing the video but essentially he talks about there are different kinds of mentors and i'll probably do a video about that too because i've been doing a in-depth study on mentors but one of the kind or different kinds of heroes <laughs> uh one of the kinds of heroes is they're they're already a hero of sorts they've gone on different journeys before and a lot of times we see these in westerns like with john wayne or clint eastwood and the thing is they don't really have a mentor but they have a code well that code serves as the archetype of the mentor in some ways whenever the hero is questioning himself or stuck in a tight spot as he's going into the journey he reminds himself of the code he reminds himself of what his per his values are or the values of his people are and that serves as the mentor and remember the mentor's purpose is essentially to do two things one equip the hero with tools for the journey and equip the hero psychologically with information or a code that they would need in order to go out and fulfill their journey. So there's that. Uh, it's really interesting when you start to think about it, but it, it basically boils down to just about any character. I, I think the two characters that can't really change are the hero and the villain. The hero in the context of the hero's journey in the monomyth is the person that the story is about, the person that the quest was given to. Now they might be an anti-hero, meaning that they're not very heroic in real life and they've taken on this mission, but, and, and they may even have been a villain in some other story or in a past life, but for this particular story, if they are the person who it's their journey, they're the hero. And we should pause here. I don't know if I've discussed this before, but keep in mind that the term hero in the hero's journey is wildly different than the term that we in popular culture have come to know. It's not someone who is magnanimous and goes out and rescues damsels in distress just because they think that's the right thing to do. That's not what a hero is. In, in the hero's journey, in mythology, in history, uh, all throughout antiquity, the hero is someone who, who is part of the normal world, receives a quest, goes into the special world, achieves the boon, and then brings it back to the normal world to share with the other people. That bringing back of the boon, that's really what separates the men from the boys in terms of heroes. The true hero is the one that takes the boon and brings it back in order to share the elixir, the, the information, whatever it is, they share that with the rest of the tribe. Just like a hunter goes out gets gets the uh you know goes out hunts gets the food for the tribe and then brings it back he doesn't just eat it all for for himself now the antagonist or the villain 
It depends on what you're looking at. So the, the, the shadow, right? That person is going to be the person who is in direct contradic contradisposition to the hero. The person who is trying to oppose the hero from achieving that goal. Sometimes it's because it's as simple as the villain is trying to save his own people. Maybe they're both hunters and they both went out for food and there's only one deer in the forest. And so they're both trying to get that deer. That's the other person trying to get that deer. That's the antagonist. Or the person who's trying to stop them. Maybe maybe it could be that the antagonist believes, you know, they're, there's someone who is big big into like animal rights. And so they they don't believe that deer should be killed by hunters and so now their objective is not necessarily to get the deer but to prevent the hero from getting the deer you catch my point those two roles i don't see them switching in a story i don't see those switching now a really talented writer might be able to show you what you think is a hero and show you what you think is a villain and then later on you find out that they're actually the opposite but as the story progresses it'll be very clear whose mission whose journey it is who is the actual hero and those roles what I'm saying is the hero can't also be the villain and then unless <laughs> I just thought of something unless see there's always there's always an unless Pardon me, I got something in my eye. There's always some one-off. Generally speaking, what I just said is the rule. But, but, consider, if you will, a hero who is his own worst enemy. A hero who maybe, you, so, a hero who basically questions himself so much that he is his own antagonist. Or a hero who maybe does have multiple personalities, like Gollum did in The Lord of the Rings. Those stories are few and far between, and it's also a much like thinner line that you can ride there. But there have been stories that have been done like that. There have been stories where the hero himself is the one who is his own his own antagonist, if you will, that internal conflict. Most stories, though, most, that's why I'm saying the general rule, is that those two, the villain and the hero, don't normally share the, aren't normally the same character sharing the same mask. Uh, but to give you an example, like, um, the, I, don't, I don't think it was a popular show, and I don't even remember the name of it, but there was, there was a show back when I was a kid that was about, like, a werewolf guy. And basically, during the day, he's a regular stand-up dude. And then when he turned into werewolf, he would terrorize the people he cared about. And there have been other stories like that, where the person that you're actually fighting against, the person that you're investigating, whatever the case, it's actually, it's actually the hero himself. But again, those stories are so few and far between. But but this but this exception to the rule just goes to show you that it really doesn't matter. Basically, any of these archetypes can be switched. So, or not? I, I don't even want to say switched, but shared. They can be shared, and that brings up another point. I know we're going on almost 20 minutes here, but I I think that this is something that we should just delve into as deep as we can, and hopefully answer all the questions that we can. Uh, so another point is the passing of the baton. Sometimes what happens is one person who had the archetype dies or is removed from the story or leaves to go follow their dreams on a different job and then in the next chapter or two or whenever it's needed some new character comes in or a character from before but then they take on that mask in a way that they hadn't before. So for example, I see this a lot with the mentor archetype. The mentor archetype, that's the one that the baton gets passed off a lot. And I think if you look at 
the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy has multiple mentors who also serve as sidekicks and allies, but each, both, you have um, her family in the beginning, in a sense, each of them have a mentorish type of role. Her uncle, her, 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 her uncles or whatever, uh, they have a mentor type role. Then when she goes into the special world, Glenda the Good Witch not only serves as a goddess, but also kind of like a mentor. She kind of guides along the way. Then, excuse me, then you have, as she meets the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Lion, they all not only serve as allies and sidekicks, but they serve also as mentors. In some way, shape, or form, each one of them represents a flaw that Dorothy has herself in terms of heart, mind, courage, but also there's something that from their flaws she learns. And in that sense, they each serve as a mentor. They also each serve as an ally. The So again, I think I've I think I've beaten this to death. I've given a lot of examples here. If there are still questions, feel free to drop them down below. The only other thing I would say is this. As a rule of thumb, but not as a not as a governing rule of physics. Most short stories, the the shorter your story, the less archetypes you're going to have because the less characters you'll probably have. The less story you can tell, the less pages you have to fit them in. The reverse is also true. The longer the story is, the more archetypes you'll have and because the more characters you'll have. And I think the best depictions of this are the ones that we've seen and we know of really well. You know, Lord of the Rings, there are multiple mentors in there. There are multiple shadows in there. There are multiple tricksters. And, and there's, it's almost like there's, you know, there's sometimes the, the, the baby trickster and then the real trickster. Or there's the, 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 the small mentor and then large mentor. Even look at Gandalf, right? Gandalf the Grey, in a sense, was a small mentor. And then he becomes Gandalf the White, and all of a sudden he's more powerful. And he seems to know a little bit more about what the journey is going to entail. It's essentially the same character, but it's also not. And you can see the villains in the same way. You know, you have the, the easy to easy to kill villains, then you have like the lieutenants, and then they're all representing the archetypes, but at different levels as well. Harry Potter, you have, again, same thing. It's almost the same story being told for six or seven books, but the characters change, the masks stay the same. They're just being passed along and shared with different people. And then also, Star Wars, right? I, here's a good example in Star Wars of where the baton of a character is passed on. You have Han who gets frozen in carbonite in episode two. And when he gets frozen in carbonite, immediately, the scenes immediately following, now we have Lando take on Han's role in episode in the end of episode two in the beginning of episode three and so for example Han is a bit of a shapeshifter when we first meet Han in the in the first movie you don't really trust him you think he's left at the end to to go pay off his debts to Java and then the last minute he comes in and he saves the day so he's kind of the anti-hero who becomes a hero in, in, in his own right. Lando is very much the same. They share he, he and Han share a similar past and similar characteristics. And you see that even there's a hint of 
foreshadowing in Cloud City when it's like Lando has tried to turn his operations legit, right? He's no longer doing smuggling stuff. He's, he's a businessman now, right? And so you can see there's a desire in the character already to be a good person. But then when he, when he was initially tested by Darth Vader coming onto the planet, he fails the test, in a sense, and he betrays uh, Han, Luke, and Leia. And so, and, and then Han gets frozen in carbonite. But then when Han is gone, essentially what happens is, then Lando takes on that shapeshifter role where, no, I, I've, I've decided I am a good guy. I am part of this cause. I am going to help you despite what it might mean, despite the sacrifice I might have to make personally with regard to the Empire. And he does. He ends up losing Cloud City, which is was his, his baby in a sense. But And then what we see in Return of the Jedi is Lando is like full-fledged part of the Rebellion. Not only does he help go in and save Han, but then later on he's promoted to general and he leads the assault on the Death Star. So, whereas before Han was fulfilling that, now that now Lando fills that gap and then in the end they all kind of come together. But the point, I hope this is illustrating the point that one, one character can take on multiple roles, but two, that the archetype itself can be passed on to different characters. And even a character who a bad guy, and this is normally true with a shapeshifter, a bad guy can become a good guy, but also vice versa. <laughs> so maybe you guys will still have questions on this, but I hope, I hope that this has been, I mean, it's 27 minutes, so I think I've given a lot of information, a lot of examples. Hopefully I've answered the question. The again, the the quick answer here is the the less characters you have, the more archetypes they can take on. Not every archetype has to be in a story, particularly if it's a shorter story. A shorter story is not going to require as many characters, not going to require as many archetypes. Longer stories Normally, that's when you start to see all the archetypes displayed and being shared and multiple archetypes on one person. Now, I will leave with this final note and then I'll let you guys go, which is this. The Most stories, though, there's going to be one archetype that a character fills the most. So, for example, Obi-Wan is most generally considered the, the mentor. Dumbledore is most generally considered the mentor. Gandalf is most generally considered the mentor. Luke is most generally considered the hero. Harry Potter is most generally... I think you guys get the point, like... Even though they may have taken on other archetypes throughout their stories, there's one that people are going to relate with them the most. And that should be the one that, that you focus on as the writer. And then, you know, also, I know I'm just rambling on, but I just keep thinking of more information. The other thing is, I think your question here. If I was to talk directly to Brian, but I'm sure other people are thinking the same thing. The other question is this. Do I try to fit all the archetypes into my story, even if it's it's only got a few characters? And I think the answer is no. Don't try to force it, especially if it's causing writer's block. If you're like, you're, you're like oh, I want to do this with my story, but I have to fit this archetype in some way. And then you go to write it and you're like, but it doesn't fit anywhere. Don't put it in there. That means it's not supposed to be in there. That means that it's just not necessary. So I think that's actually a very important point. I wish I had brought it up way earlier in the conversation, but if you're still with me at 29 minutes, don't worry about forcing the archetypes into the story. 
if they're if they don't fit if they don't make sense if they're causing you stress then that probably means they don't go <laughs> and and if they it now the the converse is true too if if you're going through your story and you're like man i really think that this this needs to happen here but i already used that archetype somewhere else it's okay have another person act as that have maybe have two two or three different mentors and we'll, we'll discuss that at some point but different types of mentors is a whole nother bag of cats but it's it's also a thing that you'll see in other stories too so all right 30 minutes of an answer I'm sure the the horse has been beaten to death if it's not dead yet it ain't gonna die so uh, I'm glad you guys keep asking questions and I hope you continue to and if you have any more questions that this video popped in your mind feel free to shoot them in the comments section below send me a PM and I'll either respond to you directly or try to make a video that everyone can benefit from okay so until I see you guys next time take it easy